Hey everyone, we are here in chapter 26, slide 34, last video for this chapter, chapter 26, the digestive system. We've gone from the oral cavity where we chewed up our food, mastication, swallowed it, deglutition, and to help along with it, we had saliva secreted into the oral cavity. Peristalsis down the esophagus, <clears throat> mixing and storage of food in the stomach, move from the stomach to the duodenum, then the jejunum and the ileum. But before we get to those latter parts of the small intestines, we get bile secretion from the gallbladder, pancreatic juice, digestive enzymes from the pancreas. We absorb nutrients. And now we're here in the large intestines. <clears throat> By this time, we've absorbed most nutrients in the food that we've eaten. So what's left over, there is still some food and some ways to get more nutrients, but we're largely developing feces. We're compacting our feces, the waste that we're going to get rid of. We're also going to, <clears throat> before we get rid of this feces, we want to reabsorb water. Uh, one, we don't want diarrhea, that's no fun. And two, um, water is valuable. We wanna absorb as much water as we can without uh, drying up the feces too much. The large intestines is large, meaning it's large in diameter, but it's short in length. It's not as long as the small intestines. It does have simple columnar epithelium with microvilli. That's what we saw in the small intestines. It's here again in the large intestines because that simple columnar epithelium with microvilli can help absorb things. We're absorbing water. <clears throat> We're also absorbing vitamins. There's good bacteria, pro probiotics in your, um, in your, uh, in your large intestines. And they help break down things that, uh, th that are nutrients to them, but we can't digest. And as a result, what they produce are vitamins, certain vitamins, not all of them. Um, so there's lots of useful bacteria that we coexist with and they help us produce some vitamins and we can absorb it. <clears throat> Take a look at this picture at the bottom right. The ileum the last part of the small intestines follows this path and then it enters into the large intestines. There is a sphincter right here. That sphincter is the ileocecal valve. Ileocecal valve. It regulates movement of what's left over from the ileum into the cecum. The cecum The cecum is the first part of the large intestines. It's a small protrusion. It kind of comes down a little bit, comes inferiorly. Uh, the cecum has that valve uh, entering it and it has an extension coming off of it, the appendix, the vermiform appendix. And as we've discussed previously, it's an important lymphatic organ, uh, has lots of lymphoid tissue, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue in it. <clears throat> Food then passes from the cecum into the next portion. This next portion is the ascending colon. The ascending colon, if you recall, is retroperitoneal. I'll just write retro here. Ascending colon is retroperitoneal, so it goes a bit posteriorly. The next portion, the transverse colon, is intraperitoneal, so it comes anteriorly. And then we come back down, the descending colon goes posteriorly again. This is also retroperitoneal. <clears throat> and then the final part of our colon is the sigmoid colon. It comes down, comes up a little bit, and then comes back down. The word sigma is for the Greek letter that looks like this. And you can see how bendy it is. And you can see how bendy this is. That's why it's called the sigmoid colon, it's sigma-like. 
So in all, when, when we when we have food pass through, we go to the cecum, might pass through the appendix, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, on our way to the rectum. All parts have simple columnar epithelium with microvilli. There's lots of goblet cells, as we'll see here in a minute when we look at the histology. What they also all have, they have large pouches. You can see the texture, the bulging texture. Those are called hostra. These pouches allow for expansion as feces is building up. There's also a band of muscle. Let me color this in green. There's a band of muscle that comes longitudinally all along the large intestines. This band of smooth muscle is called tenue coli. Tenue coli, a longitudinal band of smooth muscle. This is to help push the feces forward. It aids in peristalsis. You can have peristalsis of food, of the bolus of food down your esophagus. You can have peristalsis in your large intestines to push feces forward. <clears throat> When we look at the histology, uh, let me compare what we've seen previously first. When we look at the stomach, this first one, here's the stomach, we can see gastric pits. These, these pits go pretty deep. Look at the surface, it's relatively flat. But these are gastric pits. That's very different from what we see in the small intestines. In the small intestines, we have pr large protrusions. We have villi and, villi and pleaky. You do have crypts as well. Look at these crypts that come down here. When we get to the large intestines, you only have crypts. These are crypts. And look at how level the surface is. It's pretty level. It doesn't poke out like the villi do. So the mucosa lacks villi, but it does have crypts. You're producing lots of mucus. So you have a ton of goblet cells. Look at the high amount of goblet cells. All this light colored, all these light colored cells lining in this simple columnar epithelium mucosa. You need tons of mucus, not to protect from acid, like what we had in um, uh, the stomach. We need tons of mucus because the feces is drying up. We wanna have it smoothly pass out. We don't want to get constipated. That's one effect of having not enough mucus production <clears throat> or absorbing too much water. And, of, and we have the same layers. Uh, we have our mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and then depending on what part of the colon we're in, we'll have either serosa or, um, or adventitia. It would be adventitia for the ascending and descending colon. We've finally gone from the sigmoid colon and now we've reached the rectum. The rectum is a storage area storing feces prior to pooping. The technical word for pooping is defecation. So we've gone from mastication, deglutition, peristalsis, mixing and peristalsis, more peristalsis, till we reach the very end, uh, defecation. It is simple columnar epithelium here. We are absorbing some things. A rectum can absorb some, some, some uh, liquids and you know, whatever else might be in there. Um, take a look at this inset over here. Uh, in this inset, what we can see is that the rectum leads to the anus. The anus is the passageway out of your body. Just as we have a mouth where we have entry for food, the anus is the exit for waste. The anus, this transition to here, we're getting to non-keratinized stratified squamous. 
Anytime you're buying orifice, it's going to transition to nine keratinized stratified squamous. And you can see that transition. Look at the rectum in this histology at the bottom right. What I'm tracing in green is simple columnar epithelium. That's simple columnar. And then you can see, uh, let me change colors here in, uh, in bright pink. There we go. Here's non-keratinized stratified squamous. So now we're in the anus. So we would have passage of feces go this way. <clears throat> the anus has two sphincters in the muscularis layer. There are two sphincters in the muscularis layer. There's an internal anal sphincter, which I'm gonna color in green is here. The internal anal sphincter is made of smooth muscle. Since it's made of smooth muscle, it's controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Specifically, if we want to squeeze or if we, if we want to uh, relax it, you want to uh, use your pelvic nerves of the parasympathetic nervous system <clears throat> to defecate. To, uh, so what, when we're born, we can obviously poop. <laughs> As if you've ever had a baby, you know that. Um, the internal anal, anal sphincter works just fine. What takes practice to develop control of is the external anal sphincter. So when we get potty trained, we start using our external anal sphincter. This is skeletal muscle, so it's voluntary. You can see the blue that I'm drawing over here. That's the external anal sphincter. <clears throat> so uh, I've summarized the tract and secretions in our digestive tract. Uh, you can see as we pass from the oral cavity to the oropharynx, laryngopharynx, esophagus, stomach, duodenum, digenum, ileum, cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, anus, and whatever's left goes in the toilet. <clears throat> we can get secretions of saliva into the oral cavity. We can get secretions from the liver and gallbladder to the duodenum, as well as the pancreas to the duodenum. And when we absorb nutrients, we can absorb from the intestines to fenestrated capillaries, then to the hepatic portal vein, liver sinusoid capillaries, hepatic vein, and circulate through the rest of our body. Hopefully my car wash analogy made some sense. Uh, <clears throat> um, we put things in our mouth, we mash it up, it goes back and forth. It's mostly one way, there's a bit of mixing, and then you have your end product at the end and you've drained things, you've absorbed things along the way. Um, yeah, long journey. A lot of important organs for digestion, each with unique, very similar, but unique in their own way, uh, uh, structures to help with digestion, different types of mucus production from either mucus cells or goblet cells, uh, different secretions of enzymes. Sometimes you have acid, uh, different folds like hostra or villi, pleaky or ruji. A lot of adaptations. <clears throat> so please, uh, that, that wraps up chapter 26. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, don't forget to check out Complete Anatomy in Acklands and my own videos where I go over models. And we'll of course practice looking at cadaver stuff in, in, uh, in lab. All right. Thanks everyone. Have a great day, evening, whatever time it is. I'll talk to you all later in the next video. See you all later.